Everybody, it's Tyler here at IRI, checking team number 4678, Cyber Cavs. Uh, Ontario uh, provisional uh, finalists as well, a phenomenal season they've gone through. Also had a district win as well too. Cyber Cavs, I think uh, probably one of the teams that we most wanted to see at championships that didn't make it, but we're here and able to check out this phenomenal machine here today. Take a look at what CyberCabs has to offer. I love this entire packaging that they're able to do. This arm structure, obviously a big showpiece, but they got a lot of cool custom stuff we'll be talking about, including uh, different areas of their programming, uh, some cool headlight areas we're talking about, a couple of neat things they've been doing with their drivetrain. Let's learn more about CyberCabs and what they have to offer coming up here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in first scholarship. Scholarship applications will open in September. Get ready to go pro and get more information at kettering.edu first. Zach, let's start out on your robot talking about some of the swerve modifications uh, that you've been doing on there. And of course, we're going to be working our way up on the robot and checking out this incredible arm as well. So talking about uh, what you did from a custom aspect from your drive. So we have just pretty much standard SDS MK4Is. But one thing we wanted to do is, is change this gear out for our drive motor to a 14 tooth instead or a 16 tooth instead of a 14. So we had to move it about like that much, which was not really that much, but so we had to machine a whole entire plate and it's just four little bolts to hold it in place completely. And so we just do that for all of them instead of buying entirely new modules. Yeah, totally makes sense on there and obviously been working out great for your team so far. Yeah. Uh, on this arm here, you ha I mean, I think it's one of the huge show pieces of your robot that you had here so far. Talking about the superstructure of it and how you came up with this design. So the design here, essentially from this point, this point, and here, pretty much all of it we used from our past bot, but we just kind of redesigned it to fit the aspect of this robot. And so we just have a neat little tightening system for the dual chains that we have that are just powered by two Neos. So we just have these lock nuts here that just pull on the Neos to tighten up these chains here and there. So what does the extension of this arm look like here? Talk to me about, uh, as it comes out, what that's about, and we'll be talking more about some of the positional control too with it. Uh, so we have a, bu we have a bunch of different uh, encoders to detect where our arm is at all times. So, a so there's one over here, I believe it's a rev encoder, one up here, and then there's a few more encoders up here somewhere. And so they just tell us the exact position of the arm, and Jack will be talking about inverse kinematics is what we use to position it and how it aligns with the different coordinates. Alex, something I got to ask you about is the uh, claw. And then when we were talking earlier, you mentioned you're using a Dyneema cable as well too. Talk to me more about what both of those are. Uh, yeah, so Dyneema cable is a cable. You see some here and there's some here. It is meant to never stretch. And we can put up to 800 pounds, I believe, on this before it will even start to fray. And so we use this to close. We've got, it runs through our arm through this Bowden tube so that it stays safe and doesn't catch on anything. And we have uh, pneumatic pistons in the bottom of our robot here that pull the strings so that when they go up and down, this will close and open. And it will also move the claw forwards and backwards. And we can put an incredible amount of strength through the end of our claw. So the dynamic cable, I don't, I don't know if I've seen anything quite like that on a robot. How did you discover it and uh, where can other teams find it? I have no idea. Yeah, fair, fair enough. That's all right on there. And then on your clock here, I mean, overall, I, I think design-wise, you know, I don't think it's too complex of a design, but obviously it's been gripping really well. What made you want to choose a uh, all-in-one option for the claw or for the uh, cube and the cone? Uh, we wanted the all-in-one option because it's quicker and more versatile. We could have better weight distribution. This is actually our ninth iteration. We've had we've had wheeled options. We've had like other robots. You'll see where you'll go down and suck up the cube and the cones. We did have iterations like that, but we found that this one was our best one, and it was the most consistent in picking up cones and cubes. Jack, let's talk about some of the programming aspects of things. Uh, I mean, you got a whole plethora of uh, programming options from LiDAR to different vision options. Uh, how does it work on your robot? And kind of give us a rundown. All right. So yeah, uh, right here is our limelight. So right now it's in a position where it'd be uh, detecting cones and cubes, but it also moves on a piston up here to see reflective tape so that we know when we're meant to be placing uh, cones down. Okay, so as you can see, it kind of gets in the way of the limelight here. So down underneath our bumper, we have three LiDAR. Now, they're spaced out just enough that if there's a cone or a cube in front, 
it'll trip the one in the middle, and if it's off center, it'll trip either of the two on the sides here, so that we can center in when during auto or when we're picking up in the claws in the way. Finally, up top here is our camera that we used for picking up cones that are tipped over. It'll find the, the orientation of the cone compared to our robot, and it'll spin our claw here uh, so that it's perpendicular to the cone and it can pick up. Uh, finally, we have a driver mounted camera here and a GoPro mount on this bumper cover when it's on. As we start to wrap up on this uh, robot here, Joseph, talk to me about uh, some of the lighting uh, that you have on here in regards to what you're using for feedback uh, and uh, just kind of point out where that is and how it's working. Of course. So one of the main challenges with this game was communicating to the human player what game piece you needed to put on the grid. So what we used to solve this is these LEDs. Um, if, if we are in need of a cube, these LEDs will ch change purple. The human player knows they need to put a cube through our single substation, which is what, how we use to give game pieces to the robot, and the robot will pick it up. If it flashes yellow and we need to grab a cone to put on the pole, then the human player will slide a cone down to the single substation and it'll land in the claw which it'll grab. The LEDs are also used just when we're prepping the robot so we know everything's good, in which case the LEDs will be blue. And how about the headlights on the robot? Talk to me about yeah, those. Yeah, of course. So in our practice field, we had very inconsistent lighting due to large windows. So, so the lighting would change throughout the day and that would impair how our vision system worked. So these headlights were turned on to make consistent lighting because they would light up the area where the limelight and um, camera up there see so that the lighting and coloring is always the same. Well, Cybercast, thank you so much for taking time to tell us about this uh, robot. Congratulations on a great season. We wish you best of luck here at IRI, but can't wait to see what you bring in future years as well. Thanks a lot for taking the time. Yeah. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in first scholarship. Scholarship applications will open in September. Get ready to go pro and get more information at kettering.edu slash first. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.